Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to be singing out of the Methodist hymnal this morning, so if you get your hymn book out, and let's turn to hymn number 64. Let's all stand as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. 64. This time we'll turn it over to Brother Wayne. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you into your father's house at Old Bethel this morning. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here and all of those that might be joining us through some type of medium. Uh, I want to extend an invitation to those who are joining us uh, through a medium. If you need a church home, a place to come and belong, a family to be a part of, I'd like to commend this church to you, Old Bethel. Uh, if you like to sing the songs of faith, say the Lord's Prayer, uh, be a part of something where you'll be missed if you're not there, and cared for when you are or aren't, uh, come and worship with us, 9.30 on Sunday morning, and uh, stay for Sunday school and fellowship afterwards. Again, welcome this morning. Thank you, Brother Wayne. We're going to get back into our worship service and song this morning. Our next hymn is hymn number 261, 261, Lord of the Dance, 261.
Our next hymn this morning is 454, Open My Eyes That I May See. Well, I know Miss Shelley is wanting the kiddos to come on down. It's children's time. Good morning. We're glad to have you with us, Mary Grace. You look pretty this morning. Gracie, you did too. I like that red dress. Parker, you don't look as pretty as I do. Sorry. You're not supposed to, are you? You're a boy. Well, our Bible story today comes from Acts 16, 9 through 15. And it talks about a woman named Lydia. Uh, Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, purple probably doesn't mean a whole lot today, but back in the Bible, it was a special cloth. Not everybody could have purple cloth. You can have some purple cloth, Parker. Thank you. Um, she may have woven the purple cloth. She sold it. She may have traded with other people for valuable things for this purple cloth. And I think she was probably kind of a wealthy woman. She had a lot of power. People respected her. Uh, do you think God wanted her to be part of his family? Uh, let's see. What about Ethan back there on the back? Do you think God wants him to be part of his family? What about Lloyd back there? Do you think God wants him to be part of his family? Yeah. Well, what about Stephen Pounders over there? Do you think God wants him to be part of his family? Yeah. I think they probably all are already part of God's family. Well, we'll get back to Lydia. 
She was a dealer in purple cloth. You don't have to keep it on your head, buddy. She heard Paul tell about Jesus, and then she believed in Jesus. In fact, Lydia and her whole household were baptized. Then she invited Paul to come to her house to eat. Do you? Th um, I already asked y'all that. God wants us all to be part of his family. So y'all said you thought God wanted Lydia to be part of his family? Yes. And she was, and her whole household. All right, let's all uh, stand up and gather together like one big family. I know you don't want to, Parker. How about we hold hands while we pray? Come on, Grace, you won't buy. Hold her hand. You. Hold her hand. You. Okay, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Okay, let us pray. God, I'm so glad that you want everyone to be a part of your family. Help me to tell others that they can become part of your family. Help us all in the coming week to have opportunities to let your love show through us and all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Never turn down a sticker, right? Thank you, Miss Shelley, and thank you to the kids for our children's message this morning. At this time, if our ushers will come, we'll receive this morning's offering.
Let's remain standing and do me a favor, get your celebrational hymnal out, and I'll give you a minute to get that out. We're going to do a song called More Precious Than Silver, and it's hymn number 88. It's going to be in the celebrational hymnal this morning. This time we're going to turn it over to Brother Wayne uh, for this morning's message. Want to follow, we're going to look at Luke's gospel. We're going to look at verse, we're going to look at chapter 13, begin with verse 31, going to read through 35. Hi. Parker, purple was for kings. You'll notice on the table, on the altar table, it's purple, it's the Lord's table. So you were bestowed quite an honor by having the purple placed on you this morning. Um, that's important. There's so many things in our life happen that are monumental and we never even notice it. We never notice. We, we, we don't catch it. We miss it. That's not an accident. There is one at work in this world. There's one that rules this world at this point in time that's purposeful about distracting us, deceiving us to the point that one of his names is the great deceiver. It's a soft topic. Makes us forget who we really are, whom we really are. Lord, you are more beautiful than silver, more costly than gold. Is that who God is to you? In the season of Lent, the season of introspection, the time historically in the church when we prepared to receive new converts, when people prepared themselves, their lives, to be committed to God forever. Forever. I was talking to a, a friend this week and they're expecting their first child and they've been married five or six years and I said, well, your lives as you know them are over. They're already over. You don't realize it yet, but they're over. Your life will now be consumed by this new life. Uh, forever. Forever. Whatever happens. He smiled and agreed, and I thought, yeah, you don't have a clue. Preachers like myself, we preach the word of God. We try to speak God's word to God's people. We try to convince God's people to submit their lives to his care and his watch. And hopefully, most of the time, that happens. 
But I have to be honest. I believe truthfully that 90% of the times they just don't have a clue. They get guilted or pressured into doing something that they're really not prepared to do. Confirmation class. Confirmation class sounds really good. And it would be. But we have taken what should have taken a year and we've reduced it down to a few evenings. Uh, about 30 minutes at the session or an hour. Can you really prepare someone in, in four or five, 30 or 45 minute sessions to commit their life to something when they're of an age that they really don't even understand life? I mean, tomorrow is pretty much the extent of the weekend. You know, the world stops after the weekend. That's just it. That's as far as they project. And yet we're asking them to commit to life. It's no wonder that they just don't really quite get it. They uh, don't really stick into the family of the church for quite a while. We begin this morning with, with possibly my favorite hymn to begin a worship service. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And there again, do you even know what that word means? Sounds good. Really sounds good singing. Went to a Promise Keepers uh, meeting once in New Orleans and uh, you should have heard thousands of men stand up and sing that song. Now, I don't mean that they were perfectly tuned, but just those deep voices uh, singing, there's no women to giggle or this, that, and other. So they, they kind of sang out and it really sounded tremendous. Holy, holy, holy. That word holy <clears throat> doesn't mean sacred. We transpose the meaning of sacred onto holy. So that when we hear holy, we, or even when we speak the word holy, we really mean sacred. That's not what it means, my friends. It means completely different, completely separate completely other and there's nothing else like it. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There's no other Lord that's anything like God. There's no other God that's anything like Him. There's no other might that is anything like God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then we don't understand what life's about. We don't understand the commitment. We don't understand holy. How can we understand God? So then how can we dance? Do we have those Lord of the Dance haters? You know, there are a lot of people who don't like that song. They don't like it. They really don't want to sing it. Well, that's silly. This dance of life, who do you want to lead you? Do you want the world to lead you or do you want God? The problem, you see, is when we don't understand holy, we don't understand life, we don't understand God very little, we really don't want God to lead us. And so we either end up dancing to the leadership of someone else or we just sit it out. We just choose to sit it out. And it might sound to you sitting there, it might sound like that's really a better choice than to be led in the dance by someone other than God. But let's talk about that a moment. God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty loved us enough to give his only begotten son so that we might have life. And our choice is 
because we don't really know about God and trust him just to sit it out, just to not have life, just to exist. Happens in the church all the time. Unfortunately, some of us in the church help that happen. We re regulate, re whatever that word is, we sort of help assign people to roles in the church so that they sort of disappear. They don't exist. Parker uh, chose to sit on the kneeling cushion. I understand that. Don't have a problem with that. He's a man of principles. I understand that. And yet in spite of that, whether she did it on purpose or not, Miss Shelley awarded him royalty. Now she bragged about the beautiful young ladies here, and I can understand that also. Kind of had the same thoughts in my mind. But Parker got the sign of royalty. What's up with that? I didn't hear him say, well, now when we get up there, you put that royal cloth on me. No. You see, we don't understand God. We, we don't really trust God. We don't contemplate his part in our lives if we're even aware of it. God is at work all the time, everywhere. God is Almighty. I would have you offer that perhaps accidentally or purposely on God's part, Miss Shelley preached the better sermon here today, which happens quite often. Royalty in the eyes of God doesn't look like it does through our eyes. Qualifications, abilities, talents aren't seen by God the way we see them. In everything he has called from you, he has equipped you for. What would we pray? How are we going to fix this? We don't have a magic wand. Um, I could cut this purple up and put it on each one of you, but I don't believe that would work. If somehow we could have our eyes opened, what a novel idea. If, if, if maybe we could, I don't know, pray that the Holy Spirit might move upon us and open our eyes and illumine us that we might see Just the little glimpses of truth that God has for us. Truth. Not some kind of subjective or some kind of uh, situational, but truth. There is a thing that's called truth, and it comes from God. And it does not change with society. But we are so blinded by ourselves that it's hard for us to see it. You see, the truth, the truth for you and I, the truth that we need to be able to see, that we need to be able to live in and live through, is that in the eyes of God, all of our garments would be purple. All of them. Why? Why? How many of you are senators, representatives, Supreme Court, judge, president, governor, chief, captain, You see, those are titles that carry authority in the world. And that authority is granted by the world. 
And that authority can do a lot of things. But it cannot bring you back from the dead. But the one that knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb claimed you, sent his son to bring you home, awarded you the honor of being his child, and gave you the authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and raise the dead. There's not a captain, a governor, a president, a king that can do those things. But you can. Now you see, this lack of knowledge and understanding is helped along by the world to keep you in your place. The world loses its power when you step out of the traces, when you step out of the trenches, when you begin to act as if you belong to something other than the world, as if your life and livelihood and those of the ones you care about comes from somewhere other than the world. The world loses its power, its control. The world always wants to control. And it always wants authority. So it can control but authority is something that's granted. It's usually granted after some act that earns the respect so that other grant authority. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's the act. When the world tops that, call me. We'll talk about it. But all authority belongs to the Lord. But we have a problem. The world never stops, never sleeps. The evil one is more cunning than you and I, more powerful, more resilient, never tiring. So what are we to do? During this season of Lent, how are we to be Christ in the world? How are we to prepare to either commit our life to God through His Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and if not to commit, to recommit? How are we to do that? we first, I believe, have to understand the one that we're to put our trust, the one that we're going to grant the authority, who God himself has already given the authority over life and death. As you are able, would you please stand as I read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning with verse 31, reading through verse 35, I shall be reading this morning from a new international version of the Bible. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Look, your house has left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
My friends, the Word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. The scripture, it's, I think, helpful to understand in that first, or that 32nd verse. Uh, he replied, go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow and on the third day. I will reach my goal. That phrase, I will reach my goal, uh, comes from the word that's, um, I, I'm not good with it, te- teleos, something like that. But it's the word that's the same word where we get the phrase when Jesus is on the cross and he looks up into heaven and says, it is finished. Now Luke doesn't, in Luke's account of the crucifixion, he doesn't have that, but He has the same word here. It is finished. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. If we could forge an understanding, if we could open our mind, our hearts, if we could have the courage, that word courage comes from the Latin core heart. It comes from in here. We have the courage to live out of in here. You know, Jesus said, the time is coming and has now come that you'll no longer need to teach your sons and your daughters. For I'll write my word on their hearts. If we could live out of this heart where God's word is written and understand that when he was warned, you, you, you need to leave this place. And you have to realize it. Really? Aren't you the Pharisees? You're now so concerned about me? But no, I, I've got work to do. You see, we get so caught up in the trivialities of life that we forget that there, there's work to do. Demons need to be driven out. People need to be healed. They need to be delivered from death. How do we do that? It's real easy. We have the good news. What do you think about? What is your image of God? Get rid of all the preacherness. Get rid of all the churchiness. When you think about God, the Bible, Scripture. Does that bring joy? Is your first thought joy? Or is it trepidation? Are you worried about hell? When you speak to someone to drive out a demon, to heal them, to deliver them from death, do you ever ask them that? How often when you speak to people do you hear them talk about God, sin and salvation, scripture, the church with negative tones, with foreboding? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who those sent to you. How that's a pretty good description. Of humanity. So let's let's be real clear. He's not talking about, you know, the most faithful saint in the church every Sunday. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. I don't believe there's anybody in the world that can say, well, yeah, but I'm so much worse than those people. How does he think about us? You see, if we can ever get them to frame the understanding of who God is, it might change things. It will change things. 
What does he think about them? When he contemplates how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You see, there's the truth. There's the way and there is the life. Not Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, if you'll ever stop killing the prophets and stoning those sent to you, I'll think about taking care of you. You see, the world has programmed us that we must reinvent ourselves completely before God will have anything to do with us. That didn't come from God. That came from the world. The world's purpose is to drive a wedge between you and God. God's purpose in John chapter 3 verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but He sent Him that the world through Him might have life. God's purpose is to bring you home. Now, I know there's some bad parents in this world. There's a lot of them. Thank goodness I didn't have those. But if you have children, and we have four boys, and I promise you, I don't even want to keep tally of when I like what they're doing and when I don't. But if I could just have them with me all the time, If I could just spare them a hurt, a harm, a fear. But those days have passed. They're not little anymore. But I'm not God. God said through His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, how often I have longed to gather you to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks. There is the truth. There is the word that saves. There is the way and the life. And that's what he sends us out to tell the world. Not repent or you're going to bust hell wide open. They already know all about hell, I promise you. They may not use that terminology, but they know about loss. What they need to know about is hope. Hope. And hope is that the God that loves us loves us still and wants us to come home. Wants us to come home. He's not like us. He wants to lead us through this dance of life. For that to happen, our eyes have to be opened, and He's willing to do that. But we're not puppets. He's got a garment. The world says, oh, purple. It's the most magnificent thing in the world. God says, white. God says white. White as snow. As pure as it can be. That's the robe of Christ. And that's what he has for you and I. And for the world. Let us pray. Almighty God we thank you for the day that you've given us the opportunity. To gather together to hear your word. To let it act upon our lives. Father as surely as we hear the rain falling. May your spirit fall on us and drive any kind of fear, any kind of hurdle, anything that might keep us from your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymn books, the Methodist hymn, and turn to 348. As we sing, if you'd like to come and pray, I encourage you to do that. If you'd like someone to pray, 
with you if you'll lift a hand. Some of us will. Otherwise, we're not going to bother you. If you need to make a decision, if your life's not what it should be, if you've never committed your life to God, if you need to recommit your life to God, whatever that decision needs to be, do it now. We're, we're not promised even this afternoon, but we are given this moment. Please come as we sing 348. Excuse me. Go in peace, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you always. Amen.